What's going on, Rock Creek? You guys doing all right today? Come on, we get to do this again this week, amen? Yes. And again, when you leave this week, you don't have to break your chair down. Come on. Let me hear it one more time. Yes. It's awesome. God has blessed us. Amen. And it's Christmas break and you made it to church. Way to go. Way to go. I'm so proud of you. And for those of you watching online this week, because you're traveling, we want to say we love you. Look forward to seeing you back when you get back from wherever you are right now. We know you're not here, but we love you. All right. Hey, three quick things before we dive into the message today. Three quick things that I've been asked to announce or to share with you. First of all is this. You've got nine more days left in 2019. Somebody say amen to that. You've got nine more days left in this year. That means you've got nine more days to get your year in giving in. Every year, many of you wait till the very end of the year or you get bonused and you give uh, so generously towards the end of the year. Just want to make sure you know that those year end gifts need to be in before midnight on January 31st, technically January or uh, December 31st, technically January 1st. 2020 budget proposals and projections are at the information kiosk. If you'd like a copy of how God's going to use your giving to do ministry next year, those are out at the info kiosk and then today if you're a widow or a widower we're going to have lunch today for you a christmas lunch with sarah and myself back here in the house behind the building our office we'd love to invite you if you're not making plans to be there and you didn't know about it come on we got plenty of food we'll have a great time as we share a meal together well as i said this place is awesome and last week was an awesome day and i just want to publicly say thanks to the army of volunteers that made it happen last week can you say thank you to all of them It's crazy how many people it takes to pull this off. And all of you who uh, volunteer, you know who you are, so thank you so much. You make it possible for me to be able to do what I do because you do what you do, but you don't do do. (laughs) I make sure I say it right, all right? And as great as this place is, I want to just make sure all of you still understand this church is not the building. The church is not a building you come and sit in. It's a movement you choose to be a part of to help someone... Meet and follow Jesus. Come on, say that with me. Meet and follow Jesus. We do what we do so that people can meet and follow Jesus. Listen, I don't go to church. I go to worship because I am the church. You see, the church goes wherever you go. So you don't go to church. You just live church. You come here to worship. We exist, as I told you last week, as we looked at the vision, we looked at the core of We Are Rock Creek, is to help people meet and follow Jesus. That's the why of why we do what we do. Now, we're going to take it a little bit further today. We're going to take another step as we continue to unpack this idea of who we are or who is Rock Creek, as many of you are visiting for the very first time. But to do that, I want to talk about the fact that it's a blessing that so many of you are different in so many ways. I mean, aren't you thankful today that all of you are not like me? Come on, Sarah. Aren't you thankful that all of you are not like me? Man, can you imagine a church full of me? That'd be awful. I wouldn't even want to pastor that group. We're all different. We have different backgrounds, different upbringings, different church histories. Some of you were raised Catholic, Lutheran, Episcopal, Church of God, of holiness. You're the ones that like to have fun in church. Assembly, Baptist. So many different varieties and backgrounds of church history in this place. (laughs) In this room, and this is why I don't preach on it. This is why I preach Jesus, because he's my king and he's my Lord. But in this room, there are different political views. So let's just preach Jesus and we'll do all right. Yeah, there's different political views in this room. We root for different sports teams. We have a man in this church. I love him, but during football season, every single Sunday, he wears a Steelers jersey. Come on, folks. The Steelers? Are you kidding me? We root for different sports teams. We're all different, and that is a great thing that we are different. Thank God we're all different. Listen, unity is not uniformity. It's different. We are not cookie cutters of the same thing. God made us different for a reason. We all have a purpose in the church, in our uniqueness, and in our giftedness, in our skill set, and in our talents. So unity is not uniformity, but there is power in unity when we embrace our diversity. There's power. Now, 
if you're going to embrace unity through diversity, everybody look right here. Everybody got to get on the same page. Everybody's got to be on the same page. No hidden agenda. We got to be on the same page. Now, if you're parenting multiple children, you understand what I'm talking about. Because it's hard to get everybody in the family on the same page. Like this morning, trying to get them to church, and you threw some food down their throat and threw them in their car seats, hoping they were still clean, and then when you got out of the car, they weren't. You're like, dear Lord Jesus, I can't keep these. I've been in vocational ministry for 27 years, and the most beautiful thing about being a pastor is I have never rode to church with my family. (laughs) It's a beautiful thing. I've always had to come early. I don't know how my wife did it all those years getting those two kids to church and she was never ever late because I might have got fired like you got to be there on time girl she's like you had no idea what I do well there'll be crowns in heaven for you someday you have no idea what I'm doing but let's face it it's always better when we can all get on the same page even in our differences Let me illustrate that for you by using one of the most important things in life that all of us love and all of us need and all of us desire. French fries. Come on, somebody. French fries, yeah. Now, last week I told you I've had fluffy stages and I've had not-so-fluffy stages. I'm in a not-so-fluffy stage, and to stay that way, I have to stay away from this. This right here will make me fluffy faster than anything else under heaven. However, there is an unwritten rule that the father of the family gets to eat all of them that are in the bottom of the bag. So I just tip it over a little bit before I give it to the kids, all right? So when it comes to french fries, let me hear you. How many of you are McDonald's? Yeah. I don't even know if these things really are french fries or I I don't know what they are because if you find one of these under the van seat of your car like three days later, they don't resemble french fries. But so McDonald's, Love them. It's good fries. Some of you, however, when it comes to fries, this is your fry of choice. Come on, let me hear you. Whataburger fries. Yeah. Now, how many of you are cheering for Whataburger fries and you know it's not the French fry that makes the difference? It's the spicy ketchup. Come on. Come on. Yeah. You're like, I thought we were going to church. Use a cocktail stick. I thought we were going to church. I'm going somewhere. Stay with me. And then there's Some of you in the house, because you're so deeply spiritual, the waffle fry from Chick-fil-A is your choice. Let me hear you. Man, Pierce is going nuts down here. He likes waffle. Here you go, Pierce. You want one? Here you go. Now, before you eat that, realize I didn't buy these today. Closed on Sunday. You my Chick-fil-A. Closed on Sunday. My number one lemonade. I'm listening to Kanye too, yeah. (laughs) Many of you like the waffle fries. But listen, if you really want to enjoy a waffle fry, you got to use the nectar from the gods, the Chick-fil-A sauce, and dip them in that. Come on, somebody, let me hear you. Yeah. Now, you're like, what in the world is he talking about? I thought we, (laughs) what is this? Listen, they're all French fries. No, they're not. They're all potatoes. Just cut and made in different ways they're all different but they're the same now listen to me no matter what kind of french fry you are in and through the finished work of christ on the cross every one of us have a place at the king's table in all of our diversity and all of our differences and our weirdness and our goofiness and that is what jesus said he wanted to make his church And that is the group that he said would change the world because of the message of hope that they had. The world thinks we're crazy for many reasons, and they should because we are crazy. But we're crazies that feast at the table of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So we help people in all of our diversity, in all of our different ways, we help people meet and follow Jesus. And we do it specifically in three ways. And that's where we're going this week and next week as we look at our strategy, the Rock Creek strategy. Simple, three words that begin with the letter G. We gather as a community, what you're doing right now. We grow in community, and eventually, we can't keep this message of hope to ourselves. We go to the community. So let's unpack this week and talk about gathering as a community. Attending worship. 
showing up every single Sunday. Now listen, I don't know about your life, and I don't know about where you work, or I don't know about where you go to school, but let me just tell you, I have learned in 49 and hanging years of, uh, of being alive that there's power in showing up. There's just power in showing up. As a matter of fact, if you don't show up tomorrow or Tuesday or Wednesday for your job, just see how much power you have at your job. There's power in consistently showing up. The same is true in your spiritual journey. You see, you got to get around God's word and you got to get around God's people if you want God to get in you. Consistently showing up. And you're like, well, pastor, that's easy for you to say. You go to church because you're a pastor. No, I don't. I'm not here today because I'm your pastor. Even though if I wasn't here today, you'd be like, where's the pastor? I'm here because I need God and I need you. I need community. I need to worship God. And you need God and you need me as well. Keep showing up. Continually. Consistently. Showing up. Listen, I know this because I live in your world. The enemy has got a long list of things that will keep you from showing up. He will give you every reason under the sun for not showing up. When I grew up, everything was closed on Sunday, not just Chick-fil-A and Hobby Lobby. Everything was closed on Sunday. And so we were there in church, but now there's a plethora of opportunities and other options, and God has fallen way down on the list. But I'm going to tell you, there's power for your spiritual journey if you'll just simply keep showing up. The writer of Hebrews wrote it this way in Hebrews 10, verse 22, or 23 through 25. Let's read it together. Let us hold tightly. Let us hold tightly. Now, I'm reading out the New Living Translation this week, not the NIV. I normally preach out the NIV, but I wanted to read out the NLT this week because that word tightly is in that translation. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted. Somebody say amen. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works and let us not neglect our meeting together the writer of hebrews is already seeing that the early church is having issues with keeping showing up so he says don't neglect meeting together as some people do but encourage one another hey watch this especially now encourage one another especially in this moment as the day of his return is drawing near. The writer of Hebrews tells us three quick things that I want to unpack for you today. Give you some illustrations and then we'll let the Lord work in, our, in this room and we'll go home. But the first one is this and if you're taking notes, write it down. The writer of Hebrews says, hold tightly to hope. Hold tightly to hope. How many of you know without hope, life has no meaning? Hope is what gives life meaning. Meaning, and, and the writer of Hebrews says, hang on tightly to that hope. Holding on to hope, watch this, keeps a lot of other things in this world from holding on to you. Holding tightly to hope. What is hope? Who is hope? Paul says in Colossians 1.27, Christ in you is the hope of glory. So our hope is in Christ. And the writer of Hebrews says, hold tightly to that unwavering hope. Don't let go. Hold tightly to Jesus. Because listen, at some point in life, it's not if, but when you hit rock bottom, when you're holding close and tight to Jesus, you'll find when you hit that bottom, he's the rock that you land on. When you hold tightly to Jesus. Now, I was thinking this week, how do I visually give this to you so you completely understand what I'm talking about? This idea of clamping down and not letting go. When Jesus grabbed a hold of you, someone once said, boy, when Jesus saved that guy, he really got a big dose of salvation. No, he just held on tightly. He's holding tightly. She's holding tightly. What, is that, what does that look like? And I was thinking this week about our family dog that we had to put down three years ago. His name was Tracker, and Tracker was a fat, lazy beagle. I've got a picture of him on the screens. A fat, lazy, ornery, obnoxious, money-consuming house tearing up beagle he was our family dog 
He was our dog because our kids wanted a dog. I didn't want the dog. But I took care of the dog, fed the dog. That dog, could you put him right back up there? I mean, just, just real quick, look at the look on the dog's face. <laughs> and he, he's like, I'm in control, and you're not. And he was right. Now, that dog, the only time that dog got excited in his entire life was when he heard popcorn cooking in the microwave because he loved popcorn. But the rest of his life was spent laying in a dog bed. I mean, we couldn't motivate this dog to even play with us unless we had popcorn. He held tightly to nothing but himself. He was all about himself. He was consumed with tracker. Life was all about tracker. And consequently, I spent thousands of dollars and lots of vet visits and time keeping that dog alive because my kids loved him. And I loved him too. But he never grabbed onto anything tightly. Now, there's another dog in our family. He's not my dog. He's my brother-in-law and my sister's dog. And this is him right here. His name is Roscoe. Now, that dog is different than Tracker. This dog is 27 years old. He is in his prime and he's a blue healer and he is stout now this dog doesn't play with like little dog toys this dog plays with ropes built for cattle <laughs> and this is Roscoe's rope and the other night I was playing with Roscoe and I threw this out to Roscoe and he clamped down on it right above that knot and I put both my hands right here and I pulled as hard as I could pull and Roscoe dragged me across my parents kitchen <laughs> he could break your arms He's that strong. He is an ox, man. And man, when he bites down on this rope, it would take the depths of hell to get him to unleash on that <laughs> because he is going to hold on tightly and he is going to win the battle for the rope. And then when he finally jerks it out of your hand, he flips it with his head everywhere and tries to hit you with it to show who's boss. Listen to me, in your spiritual life with Jesus, are you Tracker or are you Roscoe? Are you just laying around in the bed hoping it all goes okay, hoping that everything plays out all right, hoping that nothing goes wrong? Maybe, just maybe every once in a while, I'll hear some popcorn cooking at the church, I'll run down there. Or are you like Roscoe? Have you gripped onto Jesus and nothing this world will throw your way will ever cause you to let go? Because you found the life-giving message of Christ. Hold tightly to hope. The second thing the writer says is to motivate one another. Verse 24 says, let us think of ways to motivate one another. Motivation is a wonderful, powerful tool, especially as a parent. Motivation is an amazing thing, especially when you're ministering to teenagers. And motivation is an amazing thing when God's got a call on your life and God's called you to something, being motivated for that brings power in your life. Now, last week I told you the story of us moving from Missouri to Texas. And when we did that, made that move, it was right before my middle school years. And those are crucial years in the life of a child. I mean, seventh grade boys and girls are just, I don't know. There's not a word in the vocabulary. I'm sorry. It's just, it's an awkward time of life. You're like, you're like in, the, in the land between, being a kid and being an adult, and you're not real sure which one you want. When responsibilities are given to you, you're like, I want to be a kid. But when they treat you like a kid, then you want to be an adult, and you're caught in between. And that was my years when we moved to Texas. And so I entered into a new school in seventh grade. I didn't know anybody in the school. It was a brand new school, Lake Dallas Middle School, Fighting Falcons, knew nobody, Walked in there for the very first time, and I met all these boys that were my age, and I found out that all the boys in seventh grade played football. Now, you have to understand, I'm from southwest Missouri. Growing up, the only ball I ever played with bounced. We didn't play football where I was from, and so I had never played football my entire life in an organized fashion. Now, I would played tackle the man with the football. That's not football. That's wrestling. But, but I had never played organized football. But I went out for the team because I wanted to be a part of the group. I wanted to fit in. So I went out for football. 
and I made the team. It's because there was only 25 boys in junior high in my school. But I made the team because if you could walk at Lake Dallas Middle School as a boy, you made the team. But I was terrible at football. I didn't, I didn't understand the game. Let me tell you how bad I was. Our coach, Charlie Huggins, a beast of a man. He was, Charlie, Charlie would spit on you from 10 miles away when he would holler at you. And he was that coach that would get that white stuff between his lips when his mouth would get dry. Yeah, that was Charlie Huggins, a beast of a man. Scared me to death the first time I met him. Well, I had talked to some of the other guys that know football, and I'd said, hey, what position should I play? And they all said, dude, you're tiny. And I was. I was about four foot three, probably weighed 90 pounds in seventh grade. You're tiny. You need to play safety because nothing's ever going to happen back there in seventh grade football. Trust me, they're not past our linebackers. Just play safety. And so Coach Charlie Huggins, the first day of practice, he said, what, what do you want to play on, on, de on defense? And I was like, safety. He's like, I think that'd be great for you. And what do you want to play on offense? Safety. <laughs> He's like, there's no such thing. And I'm like, well, that's what I want to play is safety. He said, get over there with the receivers. So I'm over here with the receivers. I'm tiny and I'm slow. It's not a good combination to be a wild rece wide receiver in football. Now, I'm going somewhere with this, so stay with me. Last week, when we opened this building, I had some family members that visited us and came and said congratulations and worshiped with us. One of those family members is an aunt of mine. Her name is Laura, but her middle name is May, so we always called her May. Now, my Aunt May, she's the sweetest aunt in the world, but she's just a bit off. I mean, some families have crazy cousin Eddie. I have Aunt May. She's just, and, and, and let me just show you how off she was and still is. Sweet, but a little strange. She brought to me last week every letter I have ever written to her in my life. And when I was in junior high, I wrote several letters to my Aunt May about living in Texas. She hands me a letter, and it's dated January 21st, 1982. It's actually written in cursive, and mom and dad, my penmanship is amazing. <laughs> Listen to what I wrote to May. How are you doing? We're just fine here. Sorry, I'm just now getting around to writing you. I've been so very busy. Because seventh grade boys are busy, right? We got a lot going on. I made the A-B honor roll for the second time this past week. I had four A's and three B's. I was really excited about my grades. I had such a great Christmas. I love this. We had a great Christmas. I got a Sanyo Walkman. <laughs> I got a pair of designer jeans, two sweaters, a watch, a weight bench that I never used, by the way. And I got a new game for my Atari and a deluxe joystick for my Atari. Come on, can I get a witness for the Atari? I got some great western cut shirts and some pointy-toed boots. Now here's where it gets good. I go to a great school. It's really strict, but it's good. I have some great teachers, and they all like me. I'm not sure that was true. Um, I live in a good neighborhood. I'm making friends. I'm beginning to really like it down here in Texas. Now, here's where it gets good. Well, I guess you could say I found out this year that I'm not very good at football. <laughs> we won district, but it was not because of me. <laughs> I'm a pretty good receiver. Now, watch. In fact, the coach told me if I had better speed, I would be excellent. And then I told May, I would have more speed if I didn't have to wear all these pads. It's really hard to run in all these pads. <laughs> now watch this. I would be excellent if I had more speed. Those were actual words that were said to me by a guy by the name of Mike Pearson. He was my seventh grade football coach. 
And I don't know if he was just being nice or if he was being true or if he just didn't want to talk to me anymore. But he's like, if you had better speed, you'd be a lot better at football. So guess what happens between seventh and eighth grade year? I get a little bigger. I get a little stronger. I get a little faster. Remember, my dad's like, you need to run around with ankle weights. You'll be faster. So I'm running up and down the neighborhood, you know, playing the theme to Rocky in my head with ankle weights on, trying to get faster, do anything I can to be better at football. Eighth grade year rolls around. I'm certainly no superstar, but I actually got to play in one game. I got on the field, and it wasn't practice. And in that game, we were playing the Sanger Indians, and we were destroying them. Come on, somebody. We were destroying them, Stephen Dietz. We were destroying the Sanger Indians. And I got to play in the game because the score was so out of whack. (laughs) Lo and behold, they call my number, and they throw a pass. And I catch it. When I caught the ball, I was like Lot's wife. I turned into a pillar of salt. (laughs) But I looked around and nobody was touching me. And I realized for the first time in that moment, I'm in the end zone. I scored a touchdown as a slow, tiny, eighth grade wide receiver when the score was 63 to nothing. As I'm running off the field to the sidelines, I remember it like it was yesterday. It wasn't the touchdown that was so amazing. It was the fact that Coach Mike Pearson ran out onto the field, met me halfway, picked me up in the air and said, I told you if you'd get faster, you would be excellent. I'll never forget that motivation. He had no idea that get faster and you'll be excellent motivated me to try harder. Listen, church, you have no idea what coming to church and saying something motivational to the next generation or to someone that's in your, in, in your stage of life, what it will do for them, how it will motivate them to make a difference, to stay with their marriage, to stay with that child, to stay with that job, to stay with Jesus and score the touchdown that God has called them to score. Listen, we get beat up all, all week long with you can't. When you come to church, we ought to be motivated with, you can. Not in judgment, but we motivate each other out of love to get stronger, to get faster, to win the game, to just keep showing up. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 says, if you do not give up, you will reap in due season. Just keep showing up. Get a little faster every week, and God's going to use you to change the world. It's what happens when we come here. We motivate each other. And then the third thing the writer of Hebrews says is encourage one another. How many of you need some encouragement today? How many of you are glad that I didn't come in here and scream at you today? You needed some encouragement. You've literally had the hell beat out of you all week. Listen, everybody look right here if you need some encouragement. Jesus was beat up so that you could be risen up. Jesus took the beating on the cross so that you could be raised up, so that you could be lifted up. So that you can be encouraged today that Jesus loves you as you are, not as you should be. But he also loves you too much to leave you as you are. He's got a great plan for your life, and we encourage you with that today. Verse 25, encourage one another. Last week, oh my goodness, last week, my brain, I have no idea what happened last week. But so many of you were like, Pastor, it's going to be okay. It, It doesn't have to be perfect, Pastor. It's going to be amazing. Just sit back, relax, rest, and enjoy the journey. I'm like, that's easy for you to say. (laughs) It's going to be great. But I needed that. I needed needed that encouragement. We've got it, Pastor. Go get in your green room and shut the door and stay in there. We need you to stay in there. We've got it. Those words, we've got it, meant all the world to me last week. Because I knew you had it. And I knew it wouldn't be perfect, and it wasn't perfect this week. But listen, we're not perfect. We're not robots. And so we're just a place where love and encouragement abounds. And I just think people out there, outside these walls, will want what we have in here when they walk in and they find love and they find grace, not condemnation. If the people of God can't encourage each other out of love, what makes you think that those outside of the family of God would want what the family of God has. As we were wrapping up our time at Navo Middle School, moving into this building, the week between, oh, the week between, 
the week between Navo and here. I have no idea how we made it, but we did. But this, this lady in our church wrote this on Facebook. Now, someone gave this to me because I don't do Facebook. But sometimes I'll hijack my wife's phone just to see what y'all are doing on Friday and Saturday night so that I get some new sermon material. But this lady in our church put this on Facebook the week between Navo and here. Just listen. Buildings don't make real churches. God's people do. I'm excited to be moving into our new building, but I will never forget what God did in my life in that middle school cafeteria. My marriage was broken and hanging on by a thread, and God restored it right there in that cafeteria. I went faithfully and honestly. Sometimes I went defiantly. I went without my husband the first time because I didn't even want to have to sit by him on Sundays. I was blown away by the care and great effort those people took to set up a school. If they would go so far as to put down rugs and place plug-ins in the middle school bathroom, come on, yeah. If they would do that every Sunday, God must be doing something special there. So when I came back and I brought my husband with me, well, he didn't like the chairs. He complained they were too uncomfortable. Yeah, anybody else feel that way? You can't feel that way no more, can you? They feel good, don't they? It was now his turn to be defiant. We chose to continue going to this church because I saw online that they had a marriage ministry called Reengage. By the way, we're bringing Reengage back in January to Rock Creek. Well, We didn't even make it to the first session of Rock Creek because we were at home arguing. It was literally that bad. So we still never made it to re-engage, but we did find a life group that met at the exact same time, and we attended that instead. And in God's time and in God's way and through God's people, God restored our marriage in that cafeteria and in that life group. On our last Sunday at the school, Pastor Brad asked us to write what God did in that room in our lives on a stone. I took my husband by the hand and led him to the front because I wanted him to see what I had wrote on my stone. I wrote, God restored our marriage. He said to me, how did you know that that was what I was going to write on my stone? That's why. That's why we didn't quit. For 12 years in that school. Because I would like to think that maybe just somehow we partnered with God. And we held tightly to our hope. And we motivated people and we encouraged a couple. And their marriage is saved. And listen to me. That couple now helps lead our 5th and 6th grade ministry. That's what it's about right there. I know. Hey, listen, I know getting to church sometimes is hard. I know. Well, I don't. It's a piece of cake for me. But I understand it's hard sometimes to get to church. I understand there's many different options. But listen, we are not going to compete with the world and try to outdo the world. Because we have a Savior that has overcome the world. We have the greatest thing to worship. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. This is not Vegas This is not American Airlines Center. This is the church of the living Savior, Jesus Christ. He is worth our attendance. Not because we do something that's flashy or we have shiny objects. He is the shiny object. He is our focus. He is why we come. And he is worth showing up and keep showing up and keep showing up and keep showing up and keep showing up up until your life and your marriage and your children's lives are changed for all eternity. He is worthy of that. That is why, that is why we gather as a community. Because every single time that we do, we always see God show off when we show up. Will you bow with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you so, so much again as we have so many times for this place. We've waited a long time, but we know you were preparing us in our waiting. 
And again, this week, we proclaim that you are the center of our focus. That this place is for you and about you. And you will be exalted here. But Lord, I just happen to believe in, in my heart that there's, there's a marriage here that's hanging on by a thread. Maybe there's someone who's willing, ready to quit and they need to be motivated to go another day to just keep showing up, to stay faithful. There's someone here, Lord, who's got a loose grip on their hope and they need to bite down tightly and hang on and fight for their faith. Lord, I pray right now you're moving in their hearts and in their lives. That you're encouraging them, that you're motivating them. And Lord, I thank you that even when rock bottom times come in Christ, you are the rock we stand on. That our hope is built on nothing less than your blood and your righteousness. That you're a firm foundation. Now in this room today, as you continue to have your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I got to thinking that maybe... When I did the french fry illustration and I said, we're all french fries, but we all have a place at the king's table. Hey, listen, you have to invite the king into your life before the king will invite you to his table. We can't just get there because we're good. We get there because he's good. And so right now in this moment, maybe you've realized I can't go to the king's table because I don't know the king of kings and the Lord of lords as my savior. I know all about him, but I don't know him personally Today is a great day for you. Because right now in this moment, if you'll pray this prayer right where you are, say, say, dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. And I recognize you as the Savior of the world. I repent of my sin. I turn my life over to you. I make you not just my Savior, but the Lord of my life. I know it's not going to be easy. I know it's not going to be perfect but I know you are the foundation of everything now. I place my faith and my trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen.